Last week, we were in Psalm chapter 46. We will not fear. Though the earth give way, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, we will not fear. We talked about God's calling on us in this season to be fearless and joyful. And we talked about 250 AD, we talked about Cyprian, we talked about how, how in the midst of the world falling apart around him, God, God worked to bring renewal and restoration to the church. But let's be honest, a lot of us don't feel like we're there. We, we don't feel fearless and joyful. No, we, we actually feel fearful. And we feel timid and weak. We feel like that, 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 that kind of mentality is a long ways away from us. The mentality of Psalm 46. And so this morning, I want to get us into a psalm, Psalm 42, that meets us in that place of feeling downcast. Feeling despair. Feeling anxiety. It meets us there. And then it points us up and out of that. And so... If you've got your Bible with you, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 42. Uh, and, and actually, this is a, a practice that some churches uh, use. If, if you're at home, why don't you just stand up where you are and we'll read the word together as we stand. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me by day. The Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. There's a refrain there. It's repeated a few times, actually. Two times in this psalm. One time in Psalm 43, which is really part of one unit with this one. And the refrain, you probably picked up on it, goes, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. The psalmist felt downcast, felt this disturbance within him. Why? Well, there are a number of pieces of evidence to suggest that the psalmist is writing this from a situation of exile. Perhaps a likely situation would have been after the Babylonians came through and conquered the city of Jerusalem in about 586 BC. They tore down the city walls, burnt down the temple, took a, a number of the Jewish people into exile into Babylon. If that was the psalmist's experience, you can understand why he would have felt downcast and disturbed. I, I mean, everything that he Everything that he counted on, everything that was dependable and predictable in his life had been, had been stripped away. The city that he loved no more, the temple that he loved to worship in, no longer functional. Perhaps even ripped away from his family, from his loved ones. No wonder he felt this way. Some of us feel a little bit like that at the moment. I mean, in one sense, we're anything but exiles. We're bound to our homes but in many other senses, this is a little bit of our experience. Everything that we 
believed was predictable and dependable about life in this world has been, has been ripped away, has been quickly changed. The aspects of the city that we loved, community centers, playgrounds, restaurants, cafes, all of this shuttered, no longer functional. And for some of us, that isolation from our loved ones, no longer able to see our friends, or we shouldn't be seeing our friends and our family members even. And so we feel that, that, that sense of being downcast, the disturbance in us. And the psalmist goes into detail about that. He says that his tears have been his food day and night. I would imagine that in an exile situation, food could become scarce, or at least you wouldn't have a lot of control over what kind of food you had access to. And that as well, there's something similar with our experience. Every day there's a new item that is being panic bought out of all the stores. This past week, if you didn't get meat, you might be a vegetarian for the next couple of weeks. I mean, food can become scarce. And the psalmist says that instead his food has been his tears. He, he's so full of sorrow that, that his own tears have been his sustenance. He says that people are asking him, where is your God? I mean, these were God's people, the Jews. And people look at this and say, your God didn't stop your city from being destroyed. He didn't stop the temple, his temple, from getting burnt to the ground. He allowed you to be exiled from his land. Where is he? He must not be that strong. He must not be that capable. Some people today will be asking that question, where is your God? Why does your God, you Christians, why does he allow a virus to sweep through, to kill thousands, to destroy life as we know it? Where is your God in all of this? That'll be a question. And the psalmist asks himself that as well. He goes, why have you forsaken me? Where are you in this? We might ask that question too. And then there's this in verse 4. The psalmist talks about how he used to go up to the house of God in safety under the protection of the mighty one and how he would do this with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. See, this is one of the clearest evidences for this being an exile psalm because he can't go to the temple. He can't worship together with the Lord's people anymore. And you hear the longing in his voice. You hear the loss that that's been for him not to be able to join together with God's people and to celebrate and worship the Lord together. And I, I read this psalm and I go, this is a psalm for our day. Has it ever happened in Canadian history where the church actually was not allowed to meet together? Or at least most churches. That's the situation we find ourselves in. And, and, and the reasons, of course, are, are right. And we shouldn't be gathering together. But still, we're not able to. And I know, I know that some of you kind of like this. You like waking up, staying in your pajamas, turning on the TV, and boom, you're at church. You like that. And I, I know that some of you introverts are loving this. I mean, you don't have to shake people's hands. You don't have to do that whole awkward small talk thing. This is great. You, you can show up late and leave early and nobody knows, right? It's great. And, and I heard from some of you that you in your living rooms felt so free to just worship God. You, you, weren't, you weren't hindered. You just kind of expressed your love and, and your worship. We got way more charismatics in our church than we knew before. It's just you're charismatic in the safety of your living room. That's that's all. You're, you're, you're on the live chat. By the way, let me just say this. My highlight last week, and probably this week again, was, was just looking at the live chat after the service, just to see people greeting each other and just kind of letting them know that, that you're watching, that you're with, with them. I, I just, I love that. You might not know this, but pastors are like sentimental grandmothers. We just, we just really love it when our people get together and talk. We just, it just warms our hearts. Is it, oh, isn't this so nice? Like our people are, like it just, it just warmed my heart. And so you're, you're, you're saying amen and hallelujah on the live chat when you would never say that out loud in person. You know, so you're, you're liking this. And, and by the way, at some point in the future, when we're all together again, I'll probably say, do hear 
what you did in your living rooms. At least I think that's safe to say. I hope that's safe to say. Do you hear what you did there? Express your worship. Let's, let's be joyful. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I already miss it. It's weird to preach to like eight people and a camera. <laughs> I, I miss, I miss seeing you. I miss being together with you. I, I miss shaking your hand. I miss praying with you. I miss going for coffee with you. I miss being together in this space. And if you're not there yet, you will be. It's, it's a loss not to be together. The psalmist knew that. And it, it, it brought about this, this feeling of downcast and disturbed. And, and we can resonate with that. And then the psalmist says this. He says that, Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. The, uh, the picture here is one of being drowned, overwhelmed by forces beyond our control. You think about if you've ever been caught up in, in undercurrents, the waves crashing over you, and, and you, could, you could easily just kind of lose control. You could just kind of become helpless as you get tossed around. That's what the psalmist is saying. He's just kind of helpless as he gets tossed around by the circumstances around him. And again, we can resonate with that. There are forces at work in our world bigger than us, things that we can't control, and it's easy for that to become a, a feeling of helplessness. I mean, all, all we're told that we should be doing is, is staying at home, and that's important. Do that. But we could kind of feel helpless. Like there's this thing out there that's just kind of dictating the circumstances of our life. Now, for the psalmist, that those forces were actually, in the end, it was it was God, your waves and your breakers have swept over me. For the Jews, it, nothing was a coincidence. Things didn't just happen. Ultimately, everything was because God was doing this work. And, and so if, if, if the Jewish people were in exile, if the temple was burnt down, it was because God was punishing Israel for their sins. Now we got to be really careful with that. We got to be really careful with saying the coronavirus is God's punishment on the world, or that it's his punishment on particular countries or people who have been especially unfaithful. I mean, for, for one thing, in the New Testament, we see that, that God's people are not defined by nationality anymore, so we'd want to be cautious about that. But then second of all, Jesus himself tells us that bad things happen to people not because they're worse sinners than others. In Luke 13, I was just reading this the other day. He says, you know how some Galileans got massacred? It's not because they were worse sinners than other people. You know that incident where that tower fell and 18 people died? Jesus says, it's not because they were worse sinners than everybody else. No, actually, you're all sinners. You all need to repent or else you'll all perish. These things don't happen. The coronavirus isn't hitting certain people, certain nations, because they've been especially unfaithful. But, but, but what we can say with the psalmist is, is that there are forces in our world ultimately permitted by God to exist that are causing us to feel helpless, it might be overwhelming us, drowning us. For all these reasons and more, the psalmist says, my soul is downcast and disturbed within me. He's brutally honest about, about this despair he feels. And I just, I want you to know that if you feel that sense of despair, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel helpless, if you feel downcast and disturbed, that's okay. Don't feel guilty about that. Don't feel like to be a holy, pious person, you need to cover that up, not express that, not bring that to God, just pretend it doesn't exist. No. The psalmist himself says, express it. He shows us the way. Say to God what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, the questions that you have. Don't be afraid of speaking them out. Be brutally honest with God. But, here's the thing. Let him move you. Let him move you from that experience to hope. And that's what the psalmist does. 
in this psalm. It's a constant wrestling match between that despair and hope. And ultimately, hope wins out. Look at how it works out. The psalmist, again, in the refrain, says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Why? Why should you put your hope in God when, when, when people are asking you, where is your God, when the tears are, are your food day and night, where you can't worship together with the Lord's people, when deep calls to deep and the roar of your waterfalls, why put your hope in God? The psalmist gives us the, the answer in three, three directions. He tells us we can put our hope in God because of the past and the present and the future. Let's look at the past. Verse 6, he says, My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Miser. I will remember you. I will remember what you have done. The psalmist calls on the history of God's interactions with his people and with the psalmist himself to say, I could put my hope in God because I've seen what he's done. And some of you, most of you, have endured crises, tragedies, trials of various kinds. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then you've probably seen God work in the midst of those. You've seen his presence. You have, you have experienced his love. You've seen him strengthen you. You've seen him make you to be a blessing in the midst of that. Maybe not in every situation, there might be some where you're still going, I don't really know what God was up to there. I don't really understand what he was doing. But there are some situations where you look back and you could say, that's how God was at work in my life. And you're going to need that. You're going to need that in seasons like this, in the present crisis, to be able to say, I remember what the Lord did in my life and I know that he'll do it again. You also got to remember what the Lord has done in the history of his people. And we talked about this last week. Again, 250 AD. You remember everything that was happening then. That plague, that epidemic that swept through and killed something like a quarter to a third of the entire population of the Roman Empire. Civil unrest, civil war, a political instability, climate change, famine, economic collapse. And in the midst of all of that, persecution of the church. Because people said, it's actually Christian's fault that all of this is happening. And we talked about how even in the midst of all of that, God used the courageous, uh, courageous the courage, let's just go with courage, with the, the, used the courage and the joy of his people to actually grow the church, to renew it, and to draw people to himself. The witness of Christians was effective in, in proclaiming the glory of God, even in the midst of all of that. God did that then. We could talk about what God did in the second century, in the epidemic then. Very similar kind of idea. We could talk about what God did in the epidemic of Martin Luther's time in Germany. We could talk even about what God did in the wake of the great wars of the 20th century. How he brought about a great hunger and thirst for him. And how there was this renewal in the church after World War II. We could see again and again and again how in situations, historical situations that looked so bleak, so hopeless, God worked. God brought about the renewal of his people and he instilled his people with courage and strength. And we could talk about what God has done in his people in scripture. We've got to remember that. I mean, think about this exact situation, the situation of exile. How bleak it would have felt like to be one of God's people and to see the temple and the city torn down and to be exiled and to go, I don't know where God is in this. Everything is, is gone. Everything's, everything's down. And yet God in exile purified his people stripped away the idolatry of his people, and then brought them back, brought them back to the promised land, restored them once again. We could talk about Jesus. Can you imagine being one of Jesus' disciples in those days between the crucifixion and the resurrection? I mean, you had seen Jesus hung on a cross, your Savior, your Lord, your Messiah, Everything you had based your life on for the last few years died 
up there on the cross. Can you imagine how, how hopeless that would have felt? And you would have known that you were, you were next. Your life was in danger too. <laughs> but then God raised him from the dead. He raised him from the dead. This is what our God does. He's the God of the resurrection. He's the God who brings about life out of death. It's like that song that we sang earlier. Do it again, right? He made a way when there was no way. And I believe that he will do it again. Why should you put your hope in God? Because we've seen what he's done in the past. Because we remember. We remember what he's done in our lives. In the history of the church. In scripture. We see who he is. And we know that he will do it again. Put your hope in God. Because we remember what he's done in the past. And put your hope in God because of who he is in the present. This is what the psalmist turns to next. He says to God, by day, well, he doesn't quite say it to God, but he says, by day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God my rock. And then he goes on to say, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? This is the wrestling match the psalmist is having within himself. He's going, I feel like God has abandoned us. I don't know where he is. That's what I feel. But I know that this other thing is true. I know that his love is with me. I know that his song is with me. I know that he's my rock. Let's talk about that. I love that image. God is my rock. I, um, I pray way better uh, outside when I'm, when I'm walking. It's why I'm just way more spiritual in March than I am in December. Uh, I just, I can get outside. And wherever I am, I end up finding somewhere outside to be able to, to pray. And so by our office, there's, there's a place right along the Seymour River. And I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how to get there because then you, you would be there and, and, and then I couldn't use it. So anyways, it's just, it's somewhere on the Seymour River. And I love just standing there and, and kind of watching the river flow by. And a little while ago, I was, I was, I was standing there and a thought occurred to me. I, I saw the water rushing. And, and sometimes the water rushes pretty strong on, on that river, right? It's, it's coming fast. And, and you just think, like, if, if you went into the, the river at that point, you could get swept away. If you're not careful, you, you could get carried away by the current. But then you look into the middle of the river, and there are these rocks. And, the, and, and some big rocks. And, and they just stand firm. Everything's shifting and changing around them. But this rock just stays there. And if I were to stand on that rock, then it wouldn't matter how quickly everything around me was happening. If I was on the rock, I'd be okay. I'd be safe. And that's who God is. It's not a perfect analogy. The water eventually erodes the rock. God doesn't get eroded by the currents of history. But you get the picture that God is steady. He's stable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so in the present time, he is our rock. Even as everything is shifting and changing and getting carried and stripped away around us, if we stand on the rock, if we're rooted and established in him, in the present, because that's who he is, then we're okay. Psalmist also says that his love is with me by day, his song over me at night. You know, it just it strikes me, these psalms are songs. And it might actually be a really good practice to memorize some of these psalms that we're going through these weeks and to, to pray them, to speak them in the morning when you wake up, in the evening before you go to bed, every time you read a news story, every time you open up your social media to remember the song. Remember these psalms. Remember who God is. Remember that his love watches over you and that he is your rock. And again, this is true whether you feel like it or not. You know, we all know this. We all know that there are things that are objectively true even if we don't feel subjectively like they are. We all know 
at some level that it's important to live by what is objectively true rather than by what we feel might be true. Here's an example to use the water image a bit more. I have a, I have a neighbor and a friend who's into scuba diving. And a while back, he was telling me about this condition that scuba divers experience called uh, nitrogen narcosis. And basically, at, at a certain depth, um, it's, you, 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 your brain starts to have tricks played on it. And when a scuba diver uh, comes down with this narcosis thing, uh, may, they might feel super confident and start making all kinds of decisions that they shouldn't, like that they have way more air than they actually have. Others become panicked. Others become disoriented and confused about which direction is up. And so a diver might think that down is actually up and might start swimming in that direction just because they're, they're disoriented. That's what they feel is true, that down is up, but but in reality, as, as, they, as they follow that feeling, they just head further, deeper down towards, ultimately towards death, if you're not careful. And it just strikes me that that's, that's the challenge here. That there are times where we don't feel like God is present with us. We look around at the world and we go, I don't see, I don't see you, I don't know what you're doing. And if we live according to those feelings, we will just swim deeper down into despair and discouragement. And you have to live according to what is objectively true, which according to the psalm is that God is with you and he loves you and he's watching over you and he is your rock. You put your hope in God because of who he is in the present, whether you feel like it or not. And you put your hope in God because of what he will do in the future. And this is ultimately what the psalmist comes to. This is how this whole wrestling match is resolved for him, is to look at the future and to go, I know that this present crisis will not last forever and that I will praise the Lord. Psalm 43, he ends with this. These are the last couple of lines. He says, I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. One final time he says, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I will praise him. I will go to the altar of God. I will come to that place. This will not last forever. And this is really what we need to know as a society at this moment. And it's what our authorities are telling us. They're saying to us, you need to make sacrifices right now. You're going to experience hardship right now, but it will not be forever. So stay the course and know that it won't, it, this is not forever. And, and nobody knows exactly how long, right? We don't know. We don't know when a vaccine will be developed exactly. We don't know how long this social distancing needs to take place and, and how severe it needs to be before this is over. There's a lot of unknowns, but we can be relatively sure that it will come to an end. This too will pass. But I think as Christians, as followers of Jesus, our hope is even more certain than that. The truth is, the world we live in is a, is a broken place. It's inevitably stained by tears and by pain. That's going to be our experience here. If it's not a pandemic, it's going to be something else. Our experience in this world will always be tinged by brokenness. But the Bible tells us that God is going to do something about this. That a day is coming when he will make a new heavens and a new earth. Revelation 21 and 22. I know I go here often, but it's so important that we know this, that we, that we are rooted in this. Talks about how God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. A place where there is no more death, no more sickness, no more crying, no more pain. A place where God's presence is all in all and his people will reign with him forever. A time when God will make a world that is everything we long for this world to be and yet isn't. That 
is the basis for our hope that God has said he will do this. I was talking to a follower of Jesus this past week, doesn't, goes to another church, isn't part of our church, but he was telling me uh, that his, uh, he has an adult son who uh, is quite paranoid about this whole pandemic and is afraid of dying. And uh, this man and his wife told their son, we're, we're, we're not afraid at all, actually. He's like, really? You're not, you're not afraid at all? They go, no, we're not. Uh, not that we want to die, but we're not afraid because we know what's on the other side of death. It's not something that we're fearful of. We trust God's promises. He was just, he was just blown, the, the son was just blown away by that. But I think that's kind of what the author of Hebrews was getting at in his famous uh, hall of faith in chapter 11. In Hebrews 11, the author begins this way. He says, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Faith and hope are based on what we do not yet see, but we trust will be because of God's character. And so the the author of Hebrews goes through this list of Old Testament saints, people like Abraham. God had promised Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to give you lots of descendants. Abraham's 80 years old, 90 90 years old. He's not seeing it. (laughs) And yet God, uh, God still promised Abraham and Abraham still had faith, even though he didn't see it in the end. He saw two, two sons and, uh, and, and that was it. He didn't, he didn't see this great nation, and yet he had trust and faith because God had promised him. And so at the end of Hebrews 11, we read that these, these Old Testament saints, were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. They were commended for their faith. They didn't receive what had been promised. And yet, and yet they still trusted. This is our calling to trust that God's promises stand firm. Even when we don't see the fulfillment of them, even when we're in the midst of a hopeless, bleak situation, to know, to know that God has promised and he's trustworthy. This too will pass and there is glory awaiting us, his children, in the future. Again, put your hope in God because of who he is in the past, in the present, in the future. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's steady. He's loving. He's faithful. He's got this. No matter what the current situation looks like, no matter how we feel about it at any given moment, Put your hope in him because he is our rock. There's one more part of this psalm that I want to bring you into. I know that would have been a good conclusion, but there's actually a bit more. The beginning of Psalm 42, I want want to take us here. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God. See, the psalmist, in the end, brings us back to thirst. Thirst for God. I heard a story. I have no idea if it's true. Us pastors, we find anecdotes on the internet, and we just use them, and we have no clue if there's any validity to it. But anyways, here, here's the story that I heard. Uh, there, was, there was a young man in a village who uh, came to an, an old, wise teacher, a man renowned for kind of walking with God, being a holy man. And the young st- student kind of asked the teacher, what, what do I need to do to find God? How do I find God? And the teacher said, come with me. Took him down to the river, brought him into the middle of the river, and then asked the young man to dip his head under, immerse himself. And so the young man did. And the old man then put his hands on top of the young man's head. Sure, the young man is thinking at this point, this was a mistake. Um, in any case, he, he holds him underwater, and, and pretty soon the young man starts, starts trying, to, trying to get up out of the water, tries beating his, his arms, trying, trying to force his way out. But the old man's got this like legendary old man strength, just like, Argh! keeping him underwater. And the young man's struggling and struggling and struggling, desperate. And finally, the old man takes his hands off at kind of the last moment, and the young man shoots out of the water, his lungs gasping 
and aching for, bre- for air. The old man waits a few moments and then says to the young man, when you desire God, as much as you just desired the air that you breathed, then you'll find him. When you desire God, as much as you desire the air you just breathed, then you'll find him. It's when everything's stripped away. When the stuff that we depended on all of a sudden is gone, that we come to grips with our deepest thirst, our most fundamental thirst. It's what happened to the psalmist in exile when the things he had taken for granted, joining together with God's people, being in the safety of Jerusalem. It's when all of that had been taken away that he realized that his deepest thirst was actually for God. You know, if you were to ask me what I think the biggest problem for people in the Western world is, I would say that it is disordered desire. It's that we long for and strive for and desire the wrong things. It's like somebody went on a run along the seawall on a hot summer day and they're just sweating profusely and they're desperate for something to satisfy their thirst. But instead they they go down to the ocean and they start taking swigs of ocean water. Or perhaps they go buy a can of Coca-Cola and just chug the whole thing. There's a temporary satisfaction, but ultimately it just makes the thirst worse. It just just exacerbates it. I, I think so many people in the Western world are trying to satisfy the thirst that they have with the distractions and the busyness and the things of this world. And it doesn't actually satisfy. And so we just seek more and more and more of these, dist- these distractions and busyness. See, and this is a problem because, because we read in the Bible that God made us for himself. He, he made us to be filled with his presence. To reflect his image. He made us for relationship with him. It's it's like Jesus, Jesus in in John chapter 4, he has this conversation with this woman at a well in Samaria. And Jesus tells her that he is the living water. And he goes on to tell her that whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus says that he is the living water who alone can satisfy that deepest thirst inside of us. Now, what does this have to do with hope? You see, whatever whatever we try to satisfy our thirst with is what we put our hope in. Those two things are the same Thing. What we put our hope in is how we are trying to satisfy our thirst. And so if you try to satisfy your thirst with the things of this world, if you think that is going to fulfill you and satisfy you, then when those things get stripped away as they do in this world, as they are right at this moment, then you have no hope. If all you have to hope for and thirst for is in this world, that's bleak. Because the stuff in this world can get stripped away. But if, if you seek to satisfy your thirst with God, if you put your hope in him, then everything else can get stripped away and you will still have hope because it's based on the living God. And so I pray, I really do pray that in this current crisis that we find ourselves in. I pray that that you will come to grips with your deepest, most fundamental thirst. I, I pray that you would become more desperate for God. I pray that this would cause you to trust in Jesus 
more than you ever have. I pray that it would cultivate in you a greater longing for his presence, that you would want to spend time with him in prayer, that you would find joy in worshiping him, that you would, that you would seek a greater understanding of him through scripture, that you would have this longing to join together with God's people in whatever way possible, in whatever way is, is appropriate in this time. Because it might not. You could respond to the current crisis by watching hours and hours and hours of Netflix. I guarantee you that's what a lot of people in our culture are doing. You could respond to this by becoming more despairing. You could drown in that. You could drown in the hopelessness and the fear and the panic. Or you can put your trust in Jesus. You can turn to him. You can express all of this to him and put your hope in him because he is the living water and the rock of our lives. Let's pray and then we'll continue on singing our praises to the Lord. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for all those who are watching this. And I want to pray, Lord, that you would show them the truth. That you are what their hearts long for. And that when everything is stripped away and when life becomes so uncertain and when our world experiences such pain and upheaval, that you are still God, that you are our rock, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I pray, Lord, for those who have put their hope in the things of this world, Lord, I pray that they would see how destined to fail that is, and that they would turn to you and put their hope in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we praise you that you are the God of the resurrection. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that we have seen it again and again and again in the past that when things looked the most hopeless, that you breathed new life. We thank you, Lord, that in the present you are our rock and we thank you that you promise us a day when you will make all things new. We thank you, Lord, that as your people, we have hope. So may we hunger and thirst for you and be renewed even in this time. Even in this time, Lord, where the earth gives way, may we be renewed because our hope is in you, our rock and our refuge. Amen.